Good evening, everybody. I'll start again. Um, I know we, we can uh, mute everybody as they come in, but maybe just for the next 30 seconds, uh, we'd stop the unmute because otherwise I have to keep clicking this. The uh, Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us on this evening's webinar. Um, and uh, I hope everybody is doing very well under these very extraordinary times. Um, and uh, we send all our best to you, your colleagues, your families uh, during what is a very worrying time for many people. We hope this evening's seminar will be informative. Uh, we're very lucky to have uh, three good speakers uh, who can uh, uh, set the scene, I suppose, uh, on where things are at with Irish surgery. And, uh, and then we'll open it up to uh, people for questions and answers uh, during the, 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 the webinar. Uh, as you know, these are not the usual way we run any meetings. So if you can um, just bear with us uh, and follow the, the sort of following kind of uh, rules around the, the meeting, it'd be great. Uh, if you're not speaking, the vast majority of us are not, uh, if you could mute your mic and mute your video, uh, then the quality of the sound is much, much better for everybody. Uh, if your mic is still on, you can get a lot of feedback. We can get a lot of um, uh, you can get a lot of uh, echo and so on, and it's not as good. Uh, and equally, if you mute your video, then you can see the main speaker coming up and uh, and and look at their slides. So we will be sharing some slides, and all will be available afterwards. Um, for the question and answer bit, we would ask that you would use the chat function. So during the, um, the, the, the presentations and the discussions, instead of people trying to uh, uh, you know, shout in and we might have multiple questions, if you can raise your questions during the, speak, the, the talks using the chat function by typing them in as text, then I will collate those questions and uh, I'd imagine there'll be kind of number of questions in the same topic area for many people and I'll try and collate those, put them to the panel and then they will uh, give an answer. Um, we will be recording the session so that we can put it out there for people who can't join us tonight. Uh, we will also uh, share um, any, uh, any of the presentations as well for people to review afterwards. Uh, we will then do up a document from the questions and answers. So if we don't get a chance to answer your question tonight, we'll certainly get to uh, deal with that question uh, later on uh, tomorrow. And uh, so that's the sort of running order on these things. So if I could ask the speakers uh, tonight, which will be the, the president, uh, Mr. Ken Mealy, uh, Professor Deborah McNamara, who's a consultant, uh, colorectal and general surgeon in Beaumont Hospital, and is also our national uh, lead uh, for the surgery program and uh, leads the, the college there uh, with the HSC on that. And also then joined by Professor Ger Curley, who's the Professor of Anesthesia and, general and Critical Care in Beaumont Hospital as well. Um, and that's our lineup for tonight. Um, so with we're, no further ado on this, as they say, I'll uh, invite everybody to, um, uh, to, to sit back and listen to what our speakers have to say. And, uh, and I just ask uh, Mr. Mealy to uh, our president uh, to uh, start the session. Thank you. Karen, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to reiterate uh, our welcome to all of you who've taken part in this tonight. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, the support of all our fellows and members, our trainees, those uh, non-consultant hospital doctors who are not trainees. I'd like to acknowledge the support of those working in the health service, in the public sector and both the private sector. And I'd also like to acknowledge many retired surgeons who have um, voted to uh, come back to service during these difficult times. I think we all acknowledge that uh, this is really difficult for patients requiring surgery in this country. And also it's difficult for surgeons who want to deliver a service, which clearly has been upended over the last number of weeks and will remain upended for the next number of months, I think. So I'd like to outline some of the things that we have been doing uh, as your college. And the first is that despite the fact that um, we are all um, uh, not able to meet socially, uh, many of the college activities have continued in a virtual fashion and many of the meetings that we contribute to have continued virtually. So surgical affairs, uh, most of the meetings that we engage with routinely have continued. Um, 
A lot of the meetings we have with the HSE and the Department of Health have continued. Um, a COVID-19 task force uh, with Colin Henry. This meets uh, weekly and we're, we're part of that. Um, the Dean, Hannah McGee and myself are on the Senior Leaders Forum, which is run by the Department of Health, uh, which the Minister uh, and the Chief Medical Officer and sometimes the Taoiseach takes part in. Uh, this morning, we had a forum of the postgraduate training bodies meeting in which we discussed training issues and what may happen in the coming months. And we'll come back to that uh, uh, later. But I mention all these so that you can be reassured that we are engaged with uh, various stakeholders in the health service currently, despite the fact that, that we do this virtually. Um, I would draw your attention to our website, uh, we have uh, put a lot of information regarding COVID-19 on our website. Uh, we have made independent statements and we've made a number of joint statements with our sister colleges in England and Scotland, uh, looking at uh, issues in particular in terms of health and safety and how we look after our staff. Um, there are also uh, statements in relation to training. And I think we can reassure our trainees that uh, we have completed our ST1 interviews, the ST2 to 3 progression interviews have all taken place. And we would hope that these uh, training programs will uh, commence, uh, our, our rotations will, will commence uh, appropriately in, in the summer months. We do understand though that there are issues in terms of progression, assessments, logbooks, and we would reassure all our trainees that nobody will be disadvantaged because of the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. And we will work through these issues with our trainees and the various training programs over the coming months. There are some specific issues which may come up tonight. Three uh, I want to mention, and the first is that of uh, safety. And while we're concerned about patient safety, as a college, as a professional body, uh, I am particularly concerned about the safety of our trainees uh, and uh, consultant colleagues. Our trainees in particular, and uh, in regard to trainee safety, one of our statements asks each of our trainers and consultants to be very clear that they understand that safety measures uh, in their hospitals are appropriate uh, for their trainees. And we need to really be seen to support our teams and colleagues in this reg regard. And I think we all understand that as this uh, COVID-19 crisis continues, many of us are going to be working in unfamiliar surroundings. Many of us may be working out with our uh, comfort zone, and this is particularly important under those circumstances. Uh, we have particular issues in relation to uh, PPEs or personal protective equipment. Uh, our own statements and the joint statements from the other colleges have indicated very clearly that we feel that all uh, aerosol generating procedures, and these include uh, intubations, extubations, uh, respiratory toilet, dental procedures, in particular, um, ENT procedures, uh, upper G endoscopies, bronchoscopies, um, uh, all our aerosol generating procedures. And also we consider that any surgery, particularly with laparoscopy, which poses particular challenges, uh, appropriate PPE uh, should be available, uh, in particularly um, uh, facial masks, uh, that should be of a standard of FFP2 or FFP3 uh, in, in terms of protection for any surgeon or team member engaged in these activities. And we can't stress this enough. We think it's very important. Uh, some of the statements come out have uh, caused some alarm in relation to uh, laparoscopy. And we would advise surgeons that they really need to use their clinical judgment. Um, there are uh, experimental evidence, particularly from the previous SARS epidemic, uh, that small particles, uh, particularly those below the size of 100 nanometers, can be uh, um, extrude in um, following laparoscopy. 
So it is important that if you are considering lapros laparoscopic surgery and if you think it is appropriate that the, the filtering and scavenging system that you have is adequate, can you be sure the seals are appropriate? Can you be sure that the filters filter down to 50 to 100 nanometers? So these are issues that we think are important and should be considered by all surgeons. We do have particular concerns for our ENT colleagues. Uh, we do understand that three ENT surgeons have died around the world. The most recent, an RCSI alumnus uh, in the UK only a few days ago. So safety is paramount and we would ask uh, all those in senior positions to be very clear about protecting their teams and understanding their responsibilities in engaging uh, with uh, procedures uh, that have um, aerosol generating potential. The second issue I just want to uh, draw attention to is issues in relation to time dependent and, and semi urgent surgery. And I think Professor McNamara may, may uh, come to this in terms of uh, later in, in, in these presentations, in terms of what the clinical programs are, are doing in this regard. Uh, we have had engagement with the Department of Health, and I know Professor McNamara has had engagement with the National Clinical Advisor for Acute Hospitals, Dr. Vida Hamilton, in this regard. And we would hope now that the private sector has been taken uh, on board within the HSE, that we will develop policies uh, in conjunction with the HSE and the Department of Health to help surgeons plan uh, time urgent and semi-elective uh, surgery. Uh, we do understand that this is a major challenge. Uh, it is being carried out on an ad hoc basis in different hospitals in different cities within the country. And we would like to standardize this because we do have concerns regarding governance, audit, quality assurance, uh, things of that nature. And we can talk about that uh, later if need be. And the logistics of this, uh, we do think uh, uh, RCSI should have in some input into it. And the third issue I want to just refer to, and that is the private sector. Uh, we understand that the private hospitals have been uh, taken over, so as to speak, by the, the HSE for the, the, the coming three months. Uh, my understanding is that uh, all consultants working in the private sector will be offered post-2012 contracts. Uh, and while uh, the contracts are not uh, something that RCSI wants to get involved in. Uh, we do have, uh, as I say, uh, an interest in, in the quality assurance, the logistics and the planning as to how uh, the private sector consultants and the hospital can contribute uh, to the, the semi-urgent and the uh, uh, time-dependent surgery as I've alluded, alluded to. So those are some of the issues that we're concerned with. Uh, safety is paramount in our, 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 our thoughts for uh, all consultants working in, the con in this country uh, or abroad for that matter, because some of you may be um, uh, dialing in from abroad uh, and we're happy to offer advice, update uh, surgeons regarding recent and, and uh, forthcoming developments in, in, on safety issues. And we would ask you uh, for your feedback, we'd ask you to look at our websites and look at um, social media outputs from RCSI, where we'll do our utmost to keep you up to date um, in, in these matters. And I'd end by wishing everybody well. We do understand this is a challenging time, not only for each of you, but also your families and colleagues. And we would endeavor to support you in whatever way we can. And as I say, we would welcome your feedback on issues that are of concern to you. So thank you for listening to me and I'll hand you back to Kira. Okay, thank you very much. President, can you can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you and I'm going to mute my mic now. Thank you. So um, the next uh, line up and again, if, if everybody can just uh, hold their questions to the end of the uh, session, it'd be great. And um, the next person we're going to ask to come in now is uh, Professor Deborah McNamara who is, uh, again, as I said, a consultant, a general surgeon, colorectal surgeon in Beaumont Hospital, and is our national lead for the National Clinical Programme in Surgery, um, and has been doing an incredible amount of work in the background uh, on a range of projects 
to support Irish surgery during this uh, crisis. So, um, Debbie, I'll hand over to you now. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me. Can you hear me, Karen? Uh, yes, I can hear you now, okay. Debbie. Yeah, go ahead. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, I suppose um, the, the purpose of speaking is really to give an update on where we are and the work that has happened over the last number of weeks, and also really to encourage fellows, members and trainees to keep in touch with us. Um, we need to hear the questions and feedback that are out in our hospitals. Um, and um, as, as um, the President and Karen mentioned earlier, we will be reviewing the, the chat from I do have a few slides and I think Erica might be putting those slides up now. Thank you. So uh, we can move to the next one. Thank you. So just a background for, for those who aren't familiar with the National Clinical Programme in Surgery. This is a strategic initiative between the HSE and RCSI, and it has been in place for about 10 years now. We work very closely, as the president has said, with the Acute Hospitals Division and especially Dr. Vita Hamilton. Um, we also work with the Chief Clinical Officer of the HSC and with Surgical Affairs and RCSI. And our function is to provide clinical leadership for the health service on issues relating to surgery. Um, the NCPS group are responsible for all areas of surgery aside from trauma and orthopedics. And um, that's led by my colleagues, uh, Mr. David Moore and Mr. Paddy Kenny. And both programs work closely together and we try to provide a voice of surgery with the, with the HSE. Next slide, please. Tonight, I'd like to cover five areas and obviously I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Um, the first is around um, guidance and we'll come through each of these areas uh, as we move along. So next slide, please. Uh, I think everyone appreciates that this is an incredibly rapidly changing environment. Um, there have been some occasions where information secured in the morning is no longer accurate by the evening. I would encourage you to review the RCSI website, um, which has been um, overhauled with information about COVID-19 in a whole range of areas relating to surgical practice and other areas. The website's updated at least daily, sometimes multiple times a day. So the most recent and up-to-date information will always be present there. Next slide, please. Um, we are talking now about surgical pathways during the COVID-19 crisis, and I suppose it's no news to any surgeon that the pathway of care for patients has changed. So there are an, really the two traditional access points of patients attending their GP and attending through the emergency department, um, but we've also had to supplement that pathway because um, it's clear that services are going to become um, overwhelmed to an extent and traditional pathways will not be functioning well. We've issued some guidance in the area of outpatients and we would encourage surgeons to take an active uh, role in, in triaging their outpatient referrals and we've set out some guidance that might be of assistance to you at this difficult time. Um, we're also encouraging ASAUs where possible to remain functional um, or to begin an ASAU capacity. And my colleague, Professor Paul Ridgway, has um, published a document today, uh, which is on our website, um, outlining how an ASAU can function. That's an acute surgical assessment unit to try and maintain some emergency surgical services, particularly in the next two to three weeks when things will be particularly challenging. Um, next slide, please. There is a new addition to the surgical pathway during this crisis, and um, I'd like to recognize the enormous amount of work that's happened um, with our CSI in getting the GP Surgeon Connect phone line up and running. Um, I need to particularly pay tribute to Kieran Ryan and Park Kelly, who worked quite literally day, night, weekends, everything to get this up and running. It went live yesterday, 
and um, I'm particularly grateful to all of the surgeons who volunteered to participate in this line. This is a single phone point of contact for GPs. Um, it enables them to speak to a consultant surgeon and we have specialists from a number of, of our specialty areas who have agreed to phone back these GPs and deal with queries as they arise. Um, we hope that this will enable GPs to manage surgical conditions more confidently in the community and to help them understand the ways to access the system, particularly over the next few weeks where uh, many surgeons will be aware that some redeployment has taken place among our junior staff and among consultant staff. Um, so this is an additional access point to support GP and primary care um, during this time. And thank you to those who have participated. You can access more information on the website um, under surgical practice. Next slide, please. The president already mentioned that we have been involved in some work on prioritization, and this has taken place over the last two to three weeks. Um, we, each of our clinical advisors, have highlighted the areas that are particularly urgent and conditions that require treatment um, in circumstances in which patients' outcomes will be compromised if we can't offer timely surgery. Um, while we have engaged very closely with NCCP, um, to prioritize cancer surgery and to try to work with each specialty to understand what the highest risk cancer patients are. We're also um, very cognizant of the fact that there are other non-cancer conditions that require urgent treatment, things like acute colitis, things like ischemic limbs. And we have included benign and malignant prioritization on the agenda. Um, Dr. Vida Hamilton has been given documents relating to each specialty um, so that that prioritization has been put on the table very early. Uh, and we're working closely with NCCP and each of the um, tumor groups of NCCP are meeting virtually and they're developing guidance um, there has been some guidance issued by NCCP on the RCSI website, and that is being updated with additional documents coming in the coming days. And there will be specialty specific guidance from NCCP to assist in um, prioritization of cancer patients. Um, it's particularly important that we're able to offer the same service across the country and that we have good access for patients who really need urgent surgery. The next point I'd like to cover, and I think the president has covered it in some detail, um, we have worked consistently to prioritize protecting surgeons and patients from COVID-19. Um, last week, NCPS uh, issued um, documentation to uh, Dr. Martin Cormican, who's one of the advisors in relation to PPE, um, who's developed many of the policies um, I'm grateful to all of the colleagues who've contacted us and through the various forums that we have access to um, who've highlighted their concerns. So, for example, we've tried to prioritize surgical issues. Some areas that haven't been given adequate consideration are now included in the consideration, such as, for example, thoracic surgery, which is a, an extremely high risk of aerosol generation, and, and perhaps because it's a smaller specialty wasn't recognized. Um, so we have issued um, a document to um, Dr. Cormican to highlight all of the areas of concern from a surgical perspective, and we're working with them to try and um, encourage the HSE to issue guidance um, that takes in count the surgical concerns that have been expressed and, and that is a very important piece of work not only um, for the president who's directly involved in dealing with this issue but also um, for all of us in NCP. And I suppose the, the uh, next point and the fifth and uh, final point I'd like to raise is around planning for restoration of services. Um, it's hard to look beyond the coming couple of weeks which we anticipate will be extremely difficult but it is incredibly important that we do not allow a situation to arise where more people die of non-COVID related illness because they haven't had access to the surgery that they require, then that we prioritize only COVID related disease. And we're working very hard to keep on the agenda, the need to maintain surgical services so that we can continue to look after all of the patients, not simply those who have COVID. 
while of course accepting that in the next couple of weeks that's going to be a priority. So we've commenced a detailed planning process to try and develop strategies and plans for managing uh, restoration of services and trying to resume uh, surgical services at the earliest time point and try and get our surgical services up and running again. Next slide, please. I would like to acknowledge all the members of our team in the National Clinical Programme in Surgery. We have a core team of members, including my co-lead, Professor John Highland, uh, and our team who are based at our CSI. And I, I would also like to particularly recognise our clinical advisors. Um, please do get in touch either with us directly or through the clinical advisors who will update us because there are some issues that can be best addressed nationally and we are very keen to continue to support and represent surgical views and the important factors relating to surgical patients in our discussions with the HSC. Next slide. This is just uh, some further information about ways to contact us. Um, the surgical practice part of the coronavirus website is kept up to date. Uh, you can follow RCSI and Surgery Ireland, which is the NCPS um, Twitter link. And please email us directly at surgeryprogram at rcsi.ie or me personally at Deborah McNamara at rcsi.ie. Thank you very much, and I'm more than happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Debbie. That was that was uh, fantastic and really informative. And you can see the amount of work that has been done on behalf of virus surgery uh, by by Debbie and all the team at the National Clinical Programs and our colleagues in TNO, emergency medicine, uh, and the clinical program radiology as well. So there's a lot of activity going on uh, in in the background to try and plan these things. Um, and uh, it's, it's it's certainly all appreciated by many of us, I'd imagine. Um, so the uh, just, just to remind everybody that we will be using the chat function to uh, ask your questions. I've had a, one or two questions come in already. Um, if you are getting any questions on any of the areas that uh, the president or, or Debbie has uh, presented on, and indeed our, our next speaker, uh, Ger, will talk about, uh, be sure just uh, write them down. I'll I'll then deliver those to the to the panel later on. Um, but without any further delay, I, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Ger Curley. Uh, who's the uh, Professor of Anesthesia and Crit Critical Care in Beaumont Hospital and in RCSI. And uh, Ger, uh, as, as, as the saying goes, you, you may recognise him for such programmes as Primetime. Um, he was on last night um, and uh, giving a, a, a great talk on, on what's going on in our hospitals. And, and Ger is at the, the real front of all of this right now, and I think he can give us a really good perspective on the clinical experience uh, with COVID-19 patients and the particular challenges they may have for, uh, for emergency surgery and so on uh, that we, we may see in, in the next uh, coming days. So uh, Ger, a hand over to you and thanks again. Kieran, thanks very much. Uh, so good evening to everybody. Um, I, I, I first I'd like to thank uh, Kieran and, and Mr. Ken Mealy, the president, and uh, Professor McNamara in the, the National Clinical Programme for inviting me to speak. Um, I have a few slides, so uh, I hope they can get uploaded now. Great, uh, so we can go into the next slide, please. Um, so, so I'm going to talk about COVID-19 and, and respiratory failure and what we've learned from the uh, disease course in Ireland and uh, ar ar around the world and how that can inform preoperative care. So um, uh, as, as you can see, uh, so you can click again, there's another uh, piece on this slide, please. Um, so actually those numbers have gone up. There's 129 um, intensive care unit confirmed COVID patients um, in Ireland. 111 of those are invasively mechanically ventilated this evening and the numbers are increasing rapidly. Um, there's also 34 suspected COVID patients this evening. 22 of those are in invasively ventilated. So you can see from the John Hopkins website that maybe a lot of you are uh, familiar with that around the world this morning there was 860,793 um, cases uh, confirmed and there were over 42,000 yeah. deaths. Um, so uh, we, we know that a number of publications have described the disease course and the disease outcome, um, but not all of it has been consistent. And, and I think it's important to 
um, draw your attention to that. So w when the Chinese came out with their first Lancet publication on the mortality of uh, patients who were ventilated with COVID-19, they, they presented a, essentially a 90, 95% mortality for patients who were invasively uh, ventilated for, for COVID-19. But um, since then, the Italians and subsequent Chinese data has demonstrated a, a mortality of about 50%, which is um, consistent really with what we see from acute respiratory distress syndrome the world over. And um, you you may be familiar with some Iranian uh, data that um, uh, a case series that, that showed a very high mortality in patients who presented for emergency surgery. And again, this was only four patients and is, is very concerning. But what what we should uh, what we shouldn't do is is jump to conclusions on the mortality from the perioperative care of these patients based on these very initial um, initial pieces of data. Um, uh, so next slide, please. Um, so uh, I suppose the most uh, reliable data we have closer to home is from the intensive care national audit and research centres. So. Um, we, through the, the um, audit programme here in Ireland um, at RCSI, participate um, in ICNARC and uh, they have released their initial experience on just over 800 uh, patients with COVID-19 in intensive care um, in uh, England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and uh, um, here in, in the South. So what we know about these patients and our experience here in Beaumont, where we, we have ventilated more patients than anyone in the country so far, is that these patients are very large. So uh, over half these patients have uh, a BMI of greater than 25 and 30% uh, of these patients have a BMI between 30 and 40. Uh, next slide, please. And. Um, so the mortality data, which was widely reported um, from, from this ICNARP data set, uh, is about around about 50%. And um, the, the caveat of that is, is that they're only reporting mortality of 165 patients because they had complete data on those 165 patients, as in they were, they were in ICU for a long enough period of time that they could report on them. Um, so there are uh, a lot more patients that are, are still undergoing mechanical ventilation and uh, in whom they, they aren't able to assign um, dead or alive. So um, it, it's likely that it, it, the, the mortality actually may, may be higher or lower, um, depending on, on how those patients are getting on. But um, broadly speaking, uh, the mortality from severe ARDS is, is around about 47% um, in or around that. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the disease course um, has been described from China and Italy and is fairly consistent. So the typical time frame of the disease is a few days of malaise followed by a dry cough, uh, fever and dyspnea. Um, the average time from hospital admission to requirement for critical care is about to two days. That's what we're seeing here also. Um, so sudden onset uh, of respiratory failure or, or kind of chorizal symptoms are uncommon. And, and it should be noted uh, that um, diarrhea has been a feature of some patients, and, and we have seen it here also, presenting uh, with COVID-19. And, and that is down to the fact that there are ACE receptors um, in the gastrointestinal tract and the virus is is uh, is present um, in stool and can be transmitted um, in this manner. Next slide, please. So the clinical course again is it's been fairly consistent. Um, what we have seen um, are patients who uh, have failed oxygen therapy on the ward um, in whatever uh, modality, whether that's high flow or even uh, non-invasive ventilation, and. Um, they develop type 1 respiratory failure and it, hypercapnia is not a feature so it's hypoxic respiratory failure that all of these patients are presenting with. 
the majority of patients who come into the ICU and require mechanical ventilation have acute respiratory distress syndrome. And when they get ventilated, their lungs are very compliant. So they're very recruitable. They respond very well to, to recruitment and to positive end expiratory pressure. But like, like other ARDS patients, um, severe shunt is, is uh, a, a big feature of this disease. So it's not, not corrected by administering uh, oxygen. Secondary complications have, um, have seemed to be a feature and seem to be um, underlying a lot of the mortality that we're seeing from uh, ARDS and, and COVID-19. So secondary bacterial infection occurs in about a quarter of patients. Acute renal failure occurs in about a quarter of patients. And then a, a myocarditis and glucose abnormalities um, presents around day five in, um, unfortunately, about a quarter of patients. And it's very difficult to, to treat without uh, putting these patients on extracorporeal life support. In general, about 10 days of mechanical ventilation is required. We've extubated several patients now who have had a fairly benign disease course, initially presenting with hypoxia, requiring mechanical ventilation, and uh, several days of hypoxia requiring uh, prone mechanical ventilation, then improving and getting extubated at, at seven days without renal replacement therapy, without the, the shock that we're seeing um, in, in some patients. Uh, next slide, please. And I, I included the non-invasive respiratory support because it's, I think it's important that we, uh, we talk about the aerosol generating procedures and deal with the, um, the issues that arise. Uh, so when we started looking after these patients, we had the idealistic view that um, we weren't going to expose ourselves to, to any aerosol generating procedure as much as possible. And high flow nasal cannula, uh, high flow nasal cannula is uh, one of those devices. Uh, sorry, somebody's come on there. We just need you to mute your microphone, please. So, Ger, we're just going to mute all and then you unmute yourself to come back in, OK? Right, Ger. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Karen. So, um, high flow nasal cannula is, is a useful modality for patients with hypoxic respiratory failure, um, but it it has the potential to generate aerosol. So does non-invasive ventilation, and uh, no matter what way you deliver it, uh, safer to deliver it with a helmet. And um, but uh, even if you do that, or you deliver it with a tight fitting, fitting face mask, and um, it can generate aerosol. So when we started off um, caring for these patients, we said, you know, no, no non-invasive respiratory support, no high flow nasal cannula. And um, but if we were to take all patients from uh, face mask oxygen directly to uh, intubation and mechanical ventilation, we would be overwhelmed. And equally, while patients shouldn't be left on non-invasive ventilation for a long period of time, there is a proportion, a small proportion, but there is a proportion of, of patients who can be managed without endotracheal intubation uh, and, and mechanical ventilation. So um, we are using non-invasive ventilation. We're using it in uh, isolation rooms, and we're wearing appropriate personal protective equipment um, for aerosol generating procedures while we're caring or examining uh, these patients. So I think there's something to be learned from, from that experience of initially balking at being anywhere near an aerosol generating procedure to realizing that it's necessary, um, but that if, if you protect yourself appropriately, um, it's, uh, it can be done in a safe manner. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just, just briefly, the, the, the way we manage these patients, of course, is supportive care and a lot of talk about ventilators um, uh, in, in the media. And of, of course, the way we ventilate these patients is the way we'll get them through and the way we'll minimise the mortality um, from uh, COVID-induced uh, ARDS. 
So low tidal volumes, we limit their plateau pressure, we limit their driving pressure, which is the difference between the plateau pressure and their peak. And um, we use neuromuscular blockade and we use high positive end expiratory pressure. We use recruitment maneuvers carefully. We turn the majority of these patients upside down um, and we ventilate them uh, in that manner for uh, 16 to 18 hours of uh, the day, of the 24 hour day. And they, they get uh, at least three and sometimes more um, episodes of prone mechanical ventilation. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, um, I haven't talked uh, a great deal about the, um, you know, when uh, to bring these patients to, to theater for emergency surgery or not. And, uh, and, and of course, the reason I haven't done that is because it is, it is not clear um, at this stage um, whether or not we, we uh, what the risk um, in terms of bringing these patients to, to theater for operative procedures, what that risk actually is. So there's some things that we know, and I suppose the, the things that we're very clear on is that um, aerosol generating procedures, and, and Mr. Mealy uh, identified those at the, at the beginning, uh, intubation, extubation, um, any uh, airway uh, surgery, um, electrocautery, uh, laparoscopic procedures, um, uh, e e abscess drainage, a lot of a, a, a lot of the things that we do are aerosol generating, including the use of high speed uh, devices. So um, appropriate PPE worn in theater is the cornerstone of uh, the management of these patients and the safe management of these patients. So uh, a, a dedicated operating room is, uh, is a good idea. Negative pressure cannot be achieved in many of these rooms, um, but is ideal. A dedicated anesthesia machine, filtering, uh, minimizing any disconnection. So we do this in the ICU and we should do it in uh, the operating room. Changing filters, uh, making sure that they are um, changed in a manner that uh, uh, doesn't generate an aerosol. And um, intubating these patients is, is much safer than putting in laryngeal mask airways and maybe safer than um, uh, regional procedures to reduce the risk of coughing. Um, minimizing staff and handoffs and um, making sure that we clean the rooms appropriately after use. So I've probably gone over my time uh, there, but hopefully we'll be able to have more discussion about um, the, uh, the exact patients that we should, uh, should and shouldn't bring down for emergency surgery um, later on. So thanks very much. So Jared, thanks a million for all that information, and it's uh, it's 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 going to be really useful for everybody, I think, to get that sort of first-hand clinical experience that you've had. Um, and uh, yeah, like we, we're slightly over on time, but uh, nonetheless, I think it's been very useful to get all this information out there. Uh, I have had a couple of queries, uh, questions come in from a number of people on the chat, and thanks for that. So if I might just uh, go to the first question uh, to the panel. Um, we have a question here about, I guess, the whole issue of redeployment, um, especially of our, say, interns and NCHDs, and uh, how to get a balance, I suppose, between answering the call and at the same time ensuring that we maintain a core of our, say, our specialty registrars, in particular, maybe, uh, to manage the uh, emergency surgeries uh, for, say, the non-COVID patients. And uh, maybe if the panel had some um, uh, comments on that and maybe how to best manage it or how it's been managed in your own hospitals right now. So I'll, I'll start off. Um, and uh, just to to say that it's 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 really important that we continue to care for um, the patients who come in with um, uh, uh, requiring emergency procedures. So it, it's really important for us in Bowman Hospital that we continue to offer um, uh, neurosurgery for for patients. Um, uh, the, the experience in Italy and the experience in in China and, and in other countries is that the mortality from uh, these common um, and and uh, treatable conditions has has skyrocketed during COVID-19. So um, in, in terms of interns, I have a bit of a responsibility for interns in our network, um, Kieran. And yes, there has been some redeployment 
uh, towards the uh, respiratory and infectious diseases. Um, but we still uh, absolutely need to, to provide support and staffing. And uh, we, we have had huge uh, help uh, in the intensive care unit and offers of help from, um, from all surgical specialties. But what I, what I would say is that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe later as we go further into the, the pandemic, we'll, we'll require more help. But I think, I think at the moment um, that our, our rotas are, are reasonably okay. And it, it, is, it is maybe at a, at a later time when if we have staff that are sick or we're completely inundated with patients. But, you know, currently I think ICUs around the country are, are operating within their capacity. Uh, any, did Debbie or uh, President, do you want to say anything there or? Um, you go Chair ahead. and I work in the same hospital, so I, um, we, we probably share some of the same perspectives. Um, some of the things that we've done on the surgical side, so our interns and SHOs are more um, being allocated to a ward and to cover a ward to try and minimize the spread throughout the hospital itself, which is a major factor of concern that our trainees would become ill by their exposure to one another. And so we are trying to work in, in, in ward-based teams. Um, and I think from the surgeon perspective, even if our trainees are deployed to assist in other areas, we are trying to maintain contact with the team to be a support to our, our, our um, surgical trainees who are finding this period very, very difficult, I think. Um, so I suppose those are the ways that we're working on it. We're encouraging surgeons and SPRs in surgery to assist when they're on call, because we are, you know, if we do have downtime on call, um, we can be of service to our colleagues at, at those times without really detracting from the surgical service in most cases. Okay, that's great. I'd add, I'd add a little bit to that. That's uh, one of the issues I think that has transpired is that there's huge variation in, in what different teams and departments are doing around the country. And while many of the surgical services, because a lot of the work is elective, uh, has been wound down, that doesn't mean surgeons don't have a role to play in terms of clinical leadership within the hospitals. And I think it's really important that clinical leads in surgical departments engage with their colleagues around the country in different hospitals to actually address these issues. What are happening to the SHOs? What are happening to the interns? And try and put in place some sort of structure. As uh, Professor McNamara has just said, it makes so much sense that you'd have clean wards, you'd have COVID wards, that you'd separate so that you'd have rounds based on a ward rather than rounds based on a team. Simple things, you don't have your intern SHO and register do rounds with you in, in a ward because if, some, if, 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 if they get contaminated, the whole team go. So there's a lot of basic principles here and we need to share this information with each other, uh, but we need to be involved, uh, particularly as uh, Jer Curley says, because in, in the coming weeks, it may well be that we're going to be asked to work in EDs. It may well be that we're going to be asked to work in, in intensive care units. And I know in some of the hospitals, they have training sessions for uh, ha, ha, uh, ventilatory uh, use, for instance. And I think surgeons should get involved in these training uh, programs at this early stage so that we can be useful uh, uh, in, in the coming weeks if need be. Okay, thanks a million for that. I mean, I, I, I think one something to mention is that there's going to be a lot of local uh, solutions required, lots of communication needed. And of course, if there's anybody who wants to share some of their, uh, the, the ideas or solutions they're coming up with with us in surgical affairs in the college, I'm more than happy to hear that. It'd be probably a good way to share that information between different groups or departments uh, on, on that one. And on a related question, I suppose, uh, but quite similar, um, is uh, the, the issue of, I guess, Ger, the uh, anesthesiologists are being uh, called in to support the ITUs and ventilate patients all the time. And the availability of anesthesia for to support a, an operation is now could become a challenge. A any tips for how that might be overcome? Thanks, uh, Karen. That's a very easy question. And um, 
Um, so, uh, look, I, I, I think that um, uh, it, it goes back to uh, the the idea that you know we we cannot allow um, you know patients to die from treatable, preventable, um, uh, surgical problems while we're we're dealing with this ongoing issue, and and this is going to go on for for weeks and and months. Um, and uh, you know, an an anesthesia and intensive care. Um, yes, we we need to put in rotas uh, in place to to uh, to staff the ICU and to um, and and yes, we need to draft in um, people from other specialties as we are doing. But it's it's fundamental that we provide cover um, in the operating theatre and. Uh, I, I definitely don't think that intensive care should take uh, precedence. It's it's a little bit like uh, you know the, this idea of of, of uh, the, the fact that we'll have to choose between two patients for for a ventilator. We shouldn't have to do that, and um, we should have enough resources in place in order to to staff both places um, appropriately. Uh, that's that's the answer. That's great. Thanks, Ger. That's 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 great on that. Um, just a, another question. I, got, I mean, we might just another just five minutes, maybe, just get through the questions, and we might call the session to a halt. Then, um, a, a, an interesting question um, here around uh, just a question from somebody. For example, if a patient is COVID nineteen positive, is there is there a risk of infection of COVID from their blood, for example? So, so there is a viremia in a small proportion of the the cases so um uh, so when you're when you're taking blood uh, obviously the blood won't aerosolize um, but it's important to wear um to wear gloves when you're when you're taking blood and the the staff in the lab are you know are aware that um the virus can be present uh, in blood so um uh, appropriate precautions but it it that won't generate an aerosol. Okay. Um, as a question, probably I'll probably answer. Uh, I had a question around uh, what about the core surgical training rotation dates. Um, I, I guess for all our trainees uh, at the moment, the colleges uh, we are working on the basis that uh, the rotations due to happen in July uh, will go as planned. It's a it's an intricate system, and in order to bring in our new cohort of trainees and move everybody around the system, it's probably uh, important that we are able to move people to their various locations. But this is a, a an ever changing environment, and uh, until we hear more from the uh, HSC on this, we, we can't give a definitive answer. But we have raised it with the HSE and DTP, and uh, it affects all the other training bodies as well. And uh, there is a fair meeting of minds on this one. And um, so we, we'd, we'd certainly have to have an answer uh, within next week or two uh, to give everybody uh, for, for know where they're going, make their plans and so on. Um, but uh, that that's all I can say on that for the moment. Um, there's a, another a number of comments that are coming uh, on on the web, and what we'll do is we'll gather up those comments and be happy to answer them to everybody uh, for tomorrow. Uh, and I don't mean to cut everything short, but we are now coming up on the hour, and we thought we'd keep this for 40 minutes. Um, I just want to thank everybody for uh, joining us on the, the webinar, and I think we've had a couple of international people as well, which is great because it's gone out to all our fellows and members in the college. Uh, I want to particularly thank the uh, speakers tonight, uh, Ger, the president, and Debbie for uh, preparing all their uh, talk and giving us a, a lot of information there to take on board. Um, I, I, obviously, the team in surgical affairs are helping us do this. We, we hope to plan a, a webinar like this every week. Uh, and cover a range of topics and stay in communication with everybody as soon as possible uh, or as much as possible. If you want uh, any particular areas covered, by all means, uh, send in any requests or any issues like that and we can see what we can do. We are working with the various surgical specialties um, to see if there's any particular needs that they want as well. And we can organize a, a webinar like this or um, a, a, a video conference or get information out to people on that. And there's a lot of very good uh, of the specialty association societies and so on are very active looking at their own areas. And I think as Debbie mentioned in her talk, um, you know, there's work at the National Cancer Control Program and for the very particular specialty areas as well. And as that information comes out, we'll be pushing it out to everybody. We'll be sharing it on the website. 
I'm very conscious there's a lot of information going out there, but uh, we're trying to only put up the information we feel is relevant and pertinent, and we have a, a reasonably good system, and we're very lucky to have the library uh, within the university to support us on that information as well. So on that, I'm just going to wish everybody a very good night and thank you very much for uh, dialing in. If you have any again, questions on this afterwards, by all means, send them in and we'll get to it. Um, and just want to wish you all very much to stay safe, stay well, look after your families, look after each other, um, and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. So thank you very much, everybody. Good night. <laughs>